Welcome to Sino Warfare with Ralph D. Sawyer. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about the strategic issues inherent to constructing and employing long and great walls for defense. Now China's extensive experience in using walls to protect cities readily translated into employing them to fortify strong points and vital passes in the spring and autumn period. And they subsequently gave rise to the idea that extended defensive lines could thwart both internal and external enemies, particularly the barbarians coming out of the north. Partly because their wealth wasn't tied to the infrastructure, but instead largely concentrated in their herds, the more vigorous steppe peoples were marked by a mobility that posed an ever-present threat to China's agriculturally based sedentary culture. Beginning in the Shang Dynasty, the Gong, Tufang, Rong, Xiongnu, Hu, Shenbei, Turks, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Khitan, Jurchen, and Mongols, who displaced one another out on the periphery, not only harassed, but also conquered parts, sometimes even all of the Chinese realm. Even when they were still on foot, and relied on chariots and wagons for their mobility, just like the Chinese, raids and incursions weren't infrequent. Even so, they multiplied during the spring and autumn period. Then, their subsequent transition to true nomadic pastoralism, with the widespread adoption of horseback riding by the early 5th century BC, dramatically increased their mobility, and thus their ability to unexpectedly strike vulnerable boulder areas. This in turn compelled the northern state of Zhao to, to develop its own cavalry forces despite aristocratic opposition in the 4th century BC. However, it wouldn't be until the end of the Warring States period that cavalry contingents began to play any significant role in military activities. It's not generally realized that the steppe raiders, always derisively termed barbarians in China, not only seized property, but also prisoners that they employed as slaves. Furthermore, rather than simply seeking profits, they sometimes brutally killed everyone, including women and children, and set buildings and crops ablaze. While projecting power and consolidating territory clearly ranked as major motivators for several early Chinese states that resorted to static defensive lines, especially on the frontier, the psychological impact of the image of the barbarian, the other, in the populace's consciousness shouldn't be underestimated. Just as the derisive term barbarian implies, the steppe peoples were almost universally disdained as culturally backward, people bereft of righteousness and humanity. In addition, their lives were thought to be consumed with lethal military training, as this well-known Shirji passage describes. Young male children are able to ride sheep and pull a bow sufficiently to shoot birds and rats. When they have grown up somewhat, the young men shoot foxes and rabbits for meat. All their warriors can fully draw their bows and serve as male cavalry. In good times, it's their custom to pursue herding and hunt birds and animals. But in straitened circumstances, they practice strikes in order to make incursions and mount attacks. This is their nature. Their cavalry was particularly noted for their skill in the reverse bow shot shown here. The Shirji goes on to describe the fighting methods. They employ bows and arrows at a distance, and sabers and short spears in close combat. If it's advantageous, they advance, but if it's not advantageous, they retreat, since they don't consider it shameful to flee in avoidance. As long as there's a prospect for profit, they don't recognize righteousness or the Li. They esteem vitality and strength, and despise age and weakness. Except for internal political purposes, everyone thus agreed they were jackals and wolves, greedy and insatiable, and cited their perverse character and behavior to justify aggressive action, whether punitive campaigns or the construction of long walls. Even though currently disparaged as simplistic, characterizing the ongoing conflict as a clash of civilization, therefore well accords with frequently expressed traditional Chinese views, 
This remains true even in the face of arguments that the walls actually provoked conflict by preventing the nomadic peoples who lived in a sort of symbiotic relationship with China from readily trading and obtaining the necessities they couldn't produce. Now, forts and castles, they've always been deemed essential to projecting power, but extended walls usually considered weak, passive measures of last resort. In China, Swinz emphasized that the strategic defensive, but in disadvantageous situations, prior to being able to adopt aggressive measures. The long walls deployed in China over the millennia were almost instead always part of a strategically conceived cluster of integrated measures designed to thwart external threats and bring peripheral areas under military and administrative control. They often therefore included massive military campaigns intended to repress or even annihilate obstreperous peoples. With the exception of the Great Wall, which was constructed under severe duress, they were erected during periods of strength rather than weakness. At the same time, even highly martial dynasties such as the Han and the Tang, that fielded enough chariot and cavalry forces to repulse invaders and defeat barbarian groups out on their own terrain, were chronically hampered by a shortage of horses due to lack of pasture land, especially when the Ordos region in the northwest lay beyond their control. Moreover, levying people to serve as soldiers was far less expensive, particularly if they were compelled to sustain themselves in the so-called agricultural military colonies that were developed out on the frontier. However, if they employed their cavalry horses in ordinary farm work, they'd quickly wear out, and that would make them generally unsuitable for the swift pursuit and wheeling maneuvers required in combat, even when they were deemed advantageous. Historical records show that forward lines entailed numerous difficulties, including the need to construct the walls, border forts, observation posts, and signal towers, to employ roving, quick response defensive forces, deploy in place contingents in significant numbers, and construct the roads integral to dispersed fortifications. Stringent border controls also had to be imposed to prevent the export of metals weapons, and advanced military knowledge and technology that could empower their opponents, and thwart defectors who might be advantageously employed for inimical purposes, as frequently happened. Logistical issues always loom large, even in peacetime, not just because of distance, but also imperial reluctance to appropriate the necessary funds to stock heavily. In combat, a unit's entire reserve of arrows might be depleted in less than an hour of intense fighting, assuming their bows and arrows hadn't become so degraded as to be useless. Environmental and seasonal issues also affected defensive strength. Rain, cold, and snow depilitated the men, ruined their equipment, eroded the walls. At planting and harvest time, when many of the troops might be tied up in agricultural work, their ability to respond was also lessened. To remedy these and other problems, and increase the effectiveness of the walls, imperial authorities implemented an array of ancillary measures. These included establishing tribute hierarchies, contracting marriage alliances, actively and passively gathering intelligence through agents, informers, prisoners, diplomatic missions, subverting and fragmenting the powerful clans out on the steppe and controlling the immediate exterior to deny the enemy access and support, whether people, property, or goods. Fortunately, the undeniably imposing walls acted as psychological deterrence to aggressors, and a calming factor for the frightened troops stationed atop them. They not only enjoyed the protection of waste walls, but also the advantage conveyed by height. Their arrows, especially their crossbow bolts, invariably had greater range and velocity than those fired by fighters who were stationed 40 feet below. In addition, the staging area could easily accommodate smaller trebuchet and acrobalista, which were well capable of hurling weighty protections several hundred paces, equipment that attackers rarely carried unless they were part of an invasion force. 
and since uh, mounted riders couldn't carry their horses up over the walls on their backs, they had to completely destroy a portion of the wall or breach a gate to reach the interior. Now, by providing area protection, border walls facilitated the expansion of terrain, migration of inhabitants, the development of agricultural colonies, and the relatively safe stationing of soldiers entrusted with mounting more or less active defense. Even though they were always too few to prevent the enemy from penetrating, they were still expected to delay them until reinforcements might arrive. But intractable issues remained. First, no matter how heavily reinforced, the gated areas were innately vulnerable. The wall portions erected on relatively flat, accessible terrain where the enemy could swiftly move about, probably ranked next in susceptibility. But the major inescapable issue was the aggressor's ability to dictate the time and place of attack. Although large infantry components naturally participated in major invasions, most assaults were conducted solely by cavalry forces that could range into the tens of thousands and concentrate at will, severely outnumbering the defenders at the largest outposts. Even when it had a million men under arms, China lacked the personnel required to defend the entire length of its walls in depth. Its armies, therefore, acted under compulsion rather than compelled others, contrary to the dictates of classical Chinese military thinking, including the art of war. Mounting an effective response depended upon being forewarned, whether by spies or informers or signals communicated from distant locations, and having enough localized firepower to increase the delay caused by the walls themselves. Pre-positioned contingents, primarily cavalry, had to rapidly respond to augment the local defenders and forces come from further along the wall. Even when brigades were able to patrol outside the walls, difficult topography often delayed their response. The contingents posted to the frontier were sometimes significantly under strength, whether due to illness or deliberate intent because the emperor feared overly empowering peripheral commanders men such as Anushan, whose rebellion roiled the Tang dynasty. And in this context, it might also be remembered that the Tang's founders derived their power from long peripheral service in the Northwest. Now, on the fallacious assumption that they would prove more loyal, a number of Chinese, including Turks, Uyghurs, Sogdians, and Koreans, were employed as border generals, even though the practice caused great resentment and disaffection among the troops. And weak emperors, who almost joyously conceded the superiority of their steppe opponents, submissively insisted upon appeasing China's enemies rather than forcefully opposing them, despite the Han and Tang's visible success. Even more despicable, with the connivance of their officials, they subverted heroic, patriotic commanders such as Yue Fei, who fervently wanted to carry the fight to the enemy. Many of the emperors were also self-centered, licentious, and brutal. Little concern for the misery of the people or the hardships of frontier military service on the border, just as described by the famous Tang Dynasty poet Li Bo. The psychological benefits of group identity, us against them, quickly wore away in the horrendous conditions that conscripts had to endure, further sapping their fighting spirit. And last among the significant issues, was the heterogeneous nature of the populace in border areas, where resettled or heritage barbarian groups might be found in considerable numbers, many inside the walls themselves. Some regimes opted to employ them, and other surrendered groups in a mercenary role. But uh, as in all human endeavors, some of them fought enthusiastically for their imperial overlords. Others were diffident or even subversive. Next time, we'll look at the walls themselves. I hope you'll join us. Meanwhile, thank you for watching.